Welcome to UOA On Demand. I'm Dr. Monica, uh, one of the hand and upper extremity specialists at University Orthopedic Associates. Uh, joining me today are my fellow uh, hand and upper extremity specialists, Dr. Liu and Dr. Letty. And today we're going to be talking about frozen shoulder. Um, so I thought we'd get started with uh, just describing some of the symptoms of, of frozen shoulder, uh, maybe uh, the type of patients that we often see frozen shoulder in. So um, I'll start with you, Dr. Liu. Uh, do you want to just maybe give us an overview of some of the symptoms of sure. frozen shoulder? Sure. So I think the most common symptom that patients come in complaining about when they have a frozen shoulder is really pain. And it doesn't necessarily have to be related to a trauma or activity or sports or anything. Sometimes it just comes on out of the blue and they just come in complaining of pain. Uh, Dr. Letty, you want to add to that? Anything else that you sometimes see? Um, occasionally, you'll have somebody give a history of a minor trauma or even um, a vaccination that can start an inflammatory process that can lead, uh, in some cases, albeit rarely, to a frozen shoulder. Um, I commonly will tell patients, you know, painful stiffness in the shoulder comes really in two major varieties. One is bad arthritis in the shoulder that can be ruled out with an x-ray. And if you otherwise have a normal x-ray and a painfully stiff shoulder, it's kind of frozen shoulder until proven otherwise. Um, there are always exceptions to the rule, but as a general rule, a painful stiff shoulder is one of those two things. And then what uh, patient population usually, like is, does this happen in, uh, would you guys say, do you see it more in men? Do you see it more in women? Yeah, so I think it is slightly more common in women. Uh, definitely more common in people who have diabetes or thyroid disorder. Uh, people who have had a prior frozen shoulder are more likely to get another one. Right. Yeah, I, I agree. So we call it adhesive capsulitis, but in these parts, most people know it as frozen shoulder. And in China, it's known as the 50-year-old shoulder. So that demographic of being 50 or older is also kind of a very common one. You could be younger and get it. But uh, a woman around the age of 50 is probably the most common time that we'll see it. And they also talk about uh, like different stages of frozen shoulder. Um, so sometimes we see it early on. Sometimes we see it in the middle. Sometimes we see it later on. Maybe Dr. Liu, do you want to talk about like the different stages that we may see? Yeah. So I think uh, the earliest stage would be someone that has pain in their shoulder, but not necessarily stiffness yet. So they come in complaining of pain. And the physical examination can be challenging because you look at them, they have pain, normal x-rays, and the exam doesn't really show stiffness or rotator cuff problems, no arthritis on x-ray. So sometimes it can be a little bit of a, a challenge to make a true diagnosis. As the frozen shoulder evolves and they develop more stiffness, and uh, I think the one of the most common findings in terms of stiffness would be a loss of external rotation at the side. So they can't reach their arm out this way because it's very stiff going out to the side. And they can't do it themselves. You try to do it for them and it still doesn't go just because it's a very stiff shoulder. Uh, and then eventually the pain will fade away, but sometimes you have residual stiffness and you know that's more of an evolution of the frozen shoulder. And then hopefully eventually the stiffness and the pain will resolve. So yes, I, I agree with uh, with Dr. Liu, where you know sometimes early on it's um, it is kind of hard to make the diagnosis because they aren't so stiff, but it is more pain um, and maybe very subtle stiffness that often does involve rotation, like you mentioned, either external rotation or or internal rotation, where they have trouble reaching behind their back. Um, so sometimes it is it is a subtle diagnosis, and then I sometimes don't make the diagnosis until the second visit when they come back, you know, a month later and then, oh, now they're, now they're definitely more stiff and, right. and then you can figure things out that way. And, and then like Dr. Letty said, it could be a very, uh, very minor trauma, right? I mean, sometimes uh, most often they don't recall it, but sometimes they, they'll come in and say, oh yeah, you know, a couple of weeks prior, I was just, um, you know, reaching behind my, in the back of the car to try to get a computer bag. And I just felt a little, little pop or a little, uh, little jolt of pain and then forgot about it. And then, you know, sure enough, two or three weeks later, the, the pain persists. Um, so that's kind of how we, I guess we make the diagnosis. Um, and then once we make the diagnosis, what, what's your go-to treatment, Dr. Letty? 
So I think the the there are two major phases of a frozen shoulder. The acute phase, the inflammatory phase, occurs in about the first three months of of when it happens, and that's very hard to pick up. As you just said, it's you don't always make the diagnosis on the first go around, so you have to have a very high you know level of clinical suspicion to catch it that early. Um, I find that you know frozen shoulder for a lot of people will hit one shoulder and then a couple of years later hit the other shoulder. And in many cases, it's easier to catch the second go round rather than the first one because patients are now aware of it. But if you do catch somebody early enough in that first three month period of time, I think a steroid injection in the shoulder can oftentimes blunt the overall progression of, of the condition so that it may not get as stiff. It may not take as long. I mean, on an average, we tell, we tell people it's a year uh, to, to kind of get over a frozen shoulder, the first three months being the inflammatory phase, and then a nine-month period that thaws out. And that's a gross generalization. There's going to be people, obviously, on both sides of that. Uh, that being said, if you catch somebody at three months, which is very, very common for the, for the first presentation, because they've seen their primary or they've seen somebody else, and by the time they get to you, they're kind of at three or four months, I don't think a steroid shot is of great value at that point. It may relieve a little bit of discomfort, a little bit of pain, nighttime pain that some patients experience, but it really doesn't soften the shoulder up or blunt the progression of the process. So in my hands, I tend to use injection if I catch them early. If I catch them more delayed, I will use preferably a home program of stretching and strengthening, a formal program of physical therapy, um, I don't find to be of tremendous value uh, other than maintaining the current flexibility and maintaining strength. In other words, I don't think seeing a therapist and having them stretch you to the point of tears is of great value. And I think that's been fairly well proven in the literature that's been written about it. So I don't really believe in aggressive manipulation or management of a frozen shoulder uh, with a patient awake. (laughs) Um, That being said, the occasional manipulation of a shoulder under anesthesia um, I don't do that very often, but I think that is a more aggressive approach. Uh, arthroscopic release uh, surgically is, again, one of those things that we will do in a, a less common environment, but certainly is a, a viable technique for the frozen shoulder that's really been lingering around a lot longer than we wanted to over a year. Dr. Liu, uh, do you have any uh, anything to add to that? Uh, yes, yeah, so the only thing I would add would be for anyone who comes in with a frozen shoulder that I've diagnosed who doesn't have a diagnosis of diabetes or thyroid disorder, I'll always tell them to go see their primary care physician to be evaluated just for some blood tests to be sure that they don't in fact have diabetes or thyroid problems. Um, because if they do, you know, you want to know that. I've diagnosed at least a handful of new diabetics who didn't even have any idea they were diabetic until they came in with their frozen shoulder, saw their PCP, got the blood work, and were shocked by the results. So not to say that it would necessarily change the the treatment plan or the outcomes, long-term outcomes, but I think it's useful information to know. I agree with that 100%. I would also echo the last statement that Dr. Liu made. The outcomes after frozen shoulder are actually typically quite good. I mean, people get their motion back. If you've maintained their strength during the process, they return back to their functional activities very, very quickly. If you don't maintain their strength during the process, then you have to spend time rehabbing them afterwards. But short of that, it is a self-limited process and not something that patients should be afraid of. It's just something, it's a bit of an ordeal to have to live through. Yeah. To have it, but it goes away. Yeah. I think oftentimes patients need a fair amount of reassurance to, to let them know that it's a long process. Sometimes we're talking, like Dr. Letty said, nine months to a year of pain, stiffness, and slowly but surely, it'll it'll work itself out, and you just have to put in the time and the effort to get your shoulder motion and function back. I just want to make one last comment um, about the because uh, I, I I feel like I gave um, physical therapy a bit of a short shrift there. There's nothing wrong with physical therapy. Um, some patients prefer it and would like to do it. My take home message for a patient would be: if you do it and you like it and you feel better after you've been stretched and strengthening, that's great. If those patients are doing therapy and really having a hard time with it, it's very painful. I, at that point, I don't think it's of great value. And I tell them to do a home program at that point, just to clarify that. Yeah, I, I definitely agree with that. I, I do often, um, you know, I do often recommend therapy, uh, but like Dr. Letty said, you know, you don't want to go through too much pain. 
and uh, and have a setback or um, or just you know feel like you're not getting better because of the pain. Um, and then, Dr. Liu, do you do steroid injections also? Uh, yeah, so pain? similar to what Dr. Letty said, I would consider a steroid injection fairly early on. Um, if they're poorly controlled diabetics, I tend to avoid them. But uh, yeah, by and large, early on, I would I would consider a steroid injection. I think once they become significantly stiff, then the the utility of the injection has kind of missed the mark already. And then just for diabetic patients listening, I guess you avoid them because the uh, steroid injections can- Right, so the raise. steroid can can transient or temporarily uh, throw their sugars out of control, even if they're well controlled on their diet and medication, even if they don't change anything about that, the, the steroid injection or steroid pills can certainly affect their sugars. And I think it's important to mention that you don't have to be a bad or brittle diabetic to have a frozen shoulder. You could be borderline diabetes and it can kick off a whole cascade of things, whether that's a frozen shoulder or a carpal tunnel or a trigger finger. Um, we still don't really understand the, the physiology behind how and why that happens, but that is a real thing that happens. And I I would again agree, I, every, well, it's it's not as common as it used to be because everybody has pretty good medical care right now, but every, uh, every once in a while, you'll find somebody that was a diabetic or a hypothyroid patient that didn't know it, and it's important to make those diagnoses because that's a disease process that can be treated. And it, the earlier you catch it, the better it is for the patient. Right. And then Dr. Lou, Dr. Letty mentioned um, manipulation under anesthesia or uh, arthroscopic release. What, what's your uh, preference for, you know, if, if I guess the timing of surgery and what surgery would you usually perform for this? Right. So routinely, you know, I would, I would have people do physical therapy extensive amounts of physical therapy, whether it's with a therapist or at home, just because, you know, like we had mentioned before, it's typically a self-limiting process where if you wait it out, give it enough time, it'll get better. Um, but for people that don't get better, I typically want them to have more stiffness than pain because my I, I feel that if you have a lot of pain going into surgery, you're going to have a lot of pain coming out of surgery and you're just going to stiffen up right again, right away. So even though we can regain motion in the shoulder, whether we manipulate you under anesthesia or we do an arthroscopic capsule release to regain motion, once you're awake from the anesthesia and your nerve block is worn off, you're gonna have a lot of pain, you're not gonna to wanna to do therapy and you're just gonna start the process all over again. Versus if we wait until the pain is improved and then we go in and we do surgery, I find that the results are a little bit better in terms of being able to manage pain afterwards and get you into therapy again right away. So as, as far as the actual surgical procedure goes, I would typically do a combination of a manipulation with arthroscopic surgery. I find that it's, it's you know, more easily controllable to do an arthroscopic surgery. You're looking directly inside the joint. You can see if there's any arthritis, any problems with the rotator cuff, any loose bodies, or any other problems that you might not have seen on uh, MRI beforehand. And then while you're doing the capsule release, you can pretty much release the entire shoulder so that you have excellent motion and any lingering stiffness you can get rid of with the manipulation. And then what's your typical like physical therapy protocol after you do that procedure? Yeah, so after that procedure, you know, typically they'll get a nerve block and that means they shouldn't have pain for the first half a day, maybe even three fourths of a day following the surgery. So once they get home, I want them to either have a physical therapy appointment that day or the next day, or be doing therapy on their own, either the same day of the surgery or the following day. You know, I think it's very important to try to maintain all the motion that you get during the time of surgery. Okay. Dr. Letty, are you pretty aggressive with therapy after, after doing a procedure like that or home program? So it depends on the findings during the procedure. I think that there are um, there are two sort of different patients that I've brought to the operating room. The ones that have, you know, they're kind of burned out. They're no longer in a lot of pain, but they're still pretty stiff. And so they're not acutely inflamed. And the manipulation of their shoulder goes quite easily. And so I book people for the potential for a manipulation under anesthesia, and if need be, further surgery, doing it arthroscopically, if it's just not what we want, just with a manipulation alone. And for those patients that manipulate easily in the operating room, and it can sometimes be surprising how quickly you can get their motion back, 
there's not too much to do. If you haven't done a whole lot of damage manipulation wise, then I don't think they need a lot of therapy other than to get moving as soon as they can. And, and I, I would echo that with Dr. Lewis. Get, got to get those folks moving right away. You don't want to create so much damage that they're in so much pain that they can't move. If you have a situation where they don't manipulate so well and you're worried that you know you could do more harm than good with manipulation alone, at that point, I think it's worth doing an arthroscopic evaluation. You might find that they have more arthritis or something else going on inside the shoulder that you weren't so aware of. Um, and it's nice to be a little bit more meticulous about how we release that. Again, trying to minimize the amount of overall trauma to the shoulder so that then they can get into a formalized physical therapy program. And so for those patients, I tend to almost insist on some you know, managed therapy afterwards uh, and pretty early on thereafter, like within a day of the surgery, I want them to see the therapist and get it moving. And then how frequently do you usually have them go to the therapist? Like, do you do it more like the first couple of weeks or is it like just two or three times a week? Yeah, for sure. I think in the beginning, they want to go three or four times a week for that first week, if you can, three anyway. Um, after that, depending upon how they're responding, I think they can tailor that off fairly quickly. So it's twice a week, you know, the next week or maybe maybe three times and then tapering down from there. It has to be somewhat individualized. They're, they're never going to be two that are exactly the same. Um, but more, more therapy when you have a more difficult case is, uh, is better in my opinion. And again, the idea would be that we want to move the shoulder, not necessarily create a lot of pain because you can get a bad rebound from that. You push too hard on it and those patients will lock up. And so we want to be very careful to sort of toe that line, just enough motion, but not letting them get too stiff. And then what would you say if, you know, if patients ask you guys, uh, okay, you know, it's been you know, six or eight months, I really haven't had any progress. I am interested in, you know, either the manipulation or anesthesia or the, the arthroscopy. Um, how soon do you guys think, you know, I, I can get back to my regular life after all this, you know, after doing a surgery, basically, what, what would you tell the patients? You know, I think it depends on what their, their expectations are in terms of activity level. If someone just has a, a an office job where they're typing on the computer all day or answering phones, doing doing IT work, something like that, then I think they'd be able to get back fairly early on. You know, I would like them to be able to do as much therapy as possible and not have their workload or their schedule work schedule get in the way of that. But I think that's completely different than someone who's a manual laborer, who's, you know, a pipe fitter, electrician, doing a lot of overhead work. I think their return to work is still going to be uh, further down the road, I see probably a couple of months before they're comfortable enough and have enough motion uh, with, you know, comfort, mo comfortable motion to get back to work efficiently. So what do you think, Dr. Letty? Yeah, I think that the, um, I mean, when you look at the, the, the stiffness to time curve on a frozen shoulder, I mean, it does taper relatively quickly. Mm -hmm. And although it's, I, we all talk about it being a year long process, when you hit about the six month mark, you have a fair amount of your motion back and the pain is usually under control. And those people are typically back doing just about everything short of the significant overhead activities that Dr. Lou mentioned. Um, so I let them go back as they can tolerate and there's not really a big reason to slow them down. It's not like these go backwards necessarily. Um, the, the, the progression should be an expected thing to get better over time. So I let them go back as they tolerate. All right. Well, do you guys have anything else uh, that you would like to add to this that we didn't cover? If you have frozen shoulder, come on in. We'll check you out. <laughs> that's, a, that's a good plan. Yeah. So I agree. Uh, frozen shoulder, we're happy. You know, any questions that come up, we're happy to see in the office. Uh, you can uh, check us out on our website, uh, uoanj.com. Uh, for any orthopedic injury conditions and especially frozen shoulders. So hopefully this has been informative and thank you for your time. Thank you.